Let us pray. Show us your ways, Lord. Teach us your paths. Guide us in your truth and teach us. For you are God, our Savior, and our hope is in you all day long. Amen. Ah, a nice, boring sermon today. After all the excitement of our doubt, CrossFit, and Epic Tales sermons that we've already had this year. As I was getting ready this week, I was looking back, and we've covered a lot of ground. In January, we went over the stories of Bible heroes to see and be inspired as to how God wants us to live into the full being of who God created us to be. Then during Lent, we looked at the stories of how Jesus taught his followers, just like we saw in the readings today, how he raised them up to do what he did and prepared them so that they could continue Jesus' ministry after he left. And as we read in the final reading today, go on and make new disciples. The last few weeks, we've been going through some really tough questions that many of us have had in moments of doubt. And we've talked about how those moments of doubt can often lead us to a greater faith. So we're all sitting here today. This should be a sweet, simple sermon about baptism, right? Let's see the next picture. Now, in my family, we baptize our children right away. This is Eric at his baptism when he was two weeks old. Uh, These are my parents, my sisters. And uh, this happened just yesterday, as you can tell, because, you know, we haven't aged at all. But in my family... We did this baptism at a family reunion. At the time, we had 13 pastors and missionaries in the family, so it was mostly the biggest problem was picking which pastor was going to do the baptism at the family gathering. But every time my family gathers, we have a church service together. Faith is an integral part of our whole family's gathering. So Eric was baptized in front of 300 Swedish Nordstroms at the Nordstrom family reunion. Uh, when he was uh, back in 2000. Now, when we look at this, this is what most of us think about with baptism. It's simple, it's sweet, there's a cute little baby. There's no controversy, there's no conflict, right? What else do we need to say? Sermon is over. But in reality, this picture alone causes some consternation among our Christian faith family. Because there are people who look at this and say, that is exactly the way it is. We should baptize our babies right away. But there's another branch of our Christian tradition that says, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh, what does the baby know? You can't get baptized until you are old enough to make the choice for yourself. Two branches of Christianity, churches have split over this. People got kicked out of countries over this. And uh, there was definitely a lot of very heated discussions, quite similar in emotion and power to the big fight we've been having over human sexuality and marriage and ordination in our denomination over the past few years. Now, we look at baptism, and we don't have that emotional feeling of conflict because this is a conflict that was resolved a while ago. We've agreed to disagree as a church. We still have denominations that do infant baptism. We still have denominations that do adult believer baptism. And the Methodist way, we do it all. We baptize you whatever age you are. If you want to be in the Methodist church and you want your children to be baptized, we'll do that. If you want your kids to wait until they're older, if you decide to wait until you're older, it's all fine. The Methodist method is we baptize anyone whatever age. Now, this leads to a second controversy that has been quite big over baptism. And this is the question of how much water is necessary. Now, long ago I heard a really great joke about a Baptist preacher and a Presbyterian preacher, and they were together. And the Presbyterian went up to the Baptist and said, I'm confused about baptism, and I just want to really understand how it works. And the Baptist is like, okay, no problem. Give me your question. And the Presbyterian's like, okay, so if I take someone and I get them in the water up to their knees, does that count? The Baptist's like, nope, nope. They got to go all the way in. And the Presbyterian's like, okay, 
So just be sure, if I get them in the water up to their neck, does that count? And the Baptist is like, no, 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 all the way in. And the Presbyterian says, well, what if they only go in up to their eyeballs? And the Baptist is like, nope, nope, it's got to be all the way in. So the Presbyterian looks at him and said, so it's really only the part on the very top of the head that counts. So churches have fought over how much water is needed, and churches have split over how much water is needed, and some people look at other people and say, you know, your baptism didn't really count because it wasn't full immersion. Now, in the earliest days of baptism, in the Jewish tradition, they had something similar to baptism. It wasn't the same, but they always had running water for it. They had water that was flowing through, like a stream or some other system where the water was flowing, because back then, they didn't have chlorine. If you had still water, it became stagnant quickly. So living water was water that was moving, because water that wasn't moving could make you sick and could kill you. So in the earliest days, people used rivers, or maybe they went to lakes. Eventually, we started meeting inside churches, and we started getting smaller fonts, I won't show you just how small the bowl is inside this font. And we started doing the sprinkling on top. So some people were still like, nope, it doesn't count if you don't do full immersion. And some people are like, but this is so nice and neat, and it fits inside the sanctuary well. So the Methodist method, what do we do? We'll use as much water as you want. I have done baptisms in swimming pools. If you want a full immersion baptism, just call me, let me know when and where and we'll get you taken care of. This Wednesday, we're actually having a baptism during confirmation for one of our students, and he has selected to do pouring, and so we will be outside with a big tin and a big pitcher, and we will pour a whole bunch of water over him. And if you want to get uh, baptized in here, we can, we have water, we are ready. So as Methodists, we will baptize anyone of any age, we will use as much water as you want. And as we think about this, perhaps we start realizing that baptism isn't as sweet and simple as we like to think. But regardless of when and where you're baptized, the third thing that I want us to remember about our Methodist tradition is that we believe in one baptism. Now this is a line that's out of the Apostles' Creed. A lot of Christian traditions believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. But there are some Christian traditions who, if you were not the age they expected or didn't use the amount of water expected, they believe that perhaps you should be rebaptized just to make sure it took correctly. I want to honor and respect all the Christian traditions around baptism, and as Methodists, we do. It doesn't matter if you were baptized someplace else, if it was Roman Catholic, if it was Baptist, if it was Orthodox. If you've been baptized at whatever age, with whatever amount of water, we respect and honor that baptism. We believe in one baptism. Next slide, please. Now, setting aside these nuts and bolts of how we do baptism, the real question is, what is God doing in baptism? Because it is easy for us to focus on the nuts and bolts. It's easy for us to decide what age should we be, and it's easy for us to decide how much water we're going to use, because those are the things we have control over. And we kind of like being in control, and we like doing the things that we have control over. You know, we can decide, I'm bringing in a tank, and we're doing a baptism in the yard. We can say, we're going to the Suamico River. I don't know that anyone wants to go to the Suamico River, but... Those are the things we control. And we tend to like to do the things that we can control. So where is God in this? Because is it really about the age or the amount of water? What is God doing? God is forgiving our sins. And God is claiming us for God's family. God gives us a role to play. God gives us free will. So we get to choose whether we're going to accept the gift of grace and salvation. 
with free will, we can say, you know, God, not for me, and we can turn away. We do have that choice. But God invites us to turn toward God to say, yes, Lord, I need your grace. I want your grace. I will receive your grace. Now, the Church of England, which is the church the Methodists used to be part of, that's where we started out, they have a phrase that our sacraments of baptism and communion are outward signs of an inward grace. It is hard for us to see what God is doing in us through baptism and communion. But the outward sign is we see the water. We take the vows of loving each other and supporting each other as members of God's church. We touch the bread, we eat, we drink. These are outward signs of an inward grace. And all through John Wesley's ministry in England, he continued to believe this about the sacraments. And it is what we continue to believe today. If you go online, the United Methodist Church has a couple PDFs that you can download from umc.org that talk about this holy mystery and goes through in detail everything we believe about baptism and communion, and those are free for anyone who really wants to get into all the details. So when we think about this inward grace, this is where God is in charge with baptism, not us. The water and our choice to stand before the church and profess our faith isn't what makes baptism count. It is God doing the work of salvation, of God giving grace and giving us a place to belong, a family that we can always be part of. So this is why we as Methodists don't worry about the water or the age, because we're not the ones in control and we're not the ones doing the work. This is God's sacrament. This is God's gift. So it doesn't matter if we understand what we're doing, whether we're two weeks old or 99 years old. Maybe we've had a traumatic brain injury. Maybe we have some way that we are not understanding everything that other people understand. None of that matters because God is doing the work. This is God's sacrament of grace. Now, many of you know that I and the worship team plan out our worship series months in advance. And so some of you are like, okay, so pastor, why are you talking about baptism now? And one of the things that has really struck me as I've been getting to know people in the Swamico area since moving here two years ago, and something that I keep seeing in my news feeds is that one of the biggest issues facing people in this community and around the world right now is loneliness. As I've been meeting people here, I hear about people who've been transferred here for work and they've gotten a house in the Howard Swamico area. They drive to work, they go down to Green Bay, they go eat, but they haven't gotten to know their neighbors. They feel isolated. This is becoming a bedroom community. And people are hungry for a place to belong, for people that they know they can depend on, a place where they can receive encouragement and support. Baptism is partly God's gift of a place to belong. It is a people that we become a part of, a people that includes the saints who've gone before us, the saints that are still to come, It is a people that goes through space and time. We have a place to belong. And this is a message that is needed in the world today. God says, you belong here. God says, you belong to me and to the church family. We read how in the waters of the Jordan River, God said to Jesus, this is my beloved son, in whom I find happiness. Some of us are used to translation, in whom I am well pleased. The message that so many people need to hear right now is that there is a God, God loves you, and God is pleased with you. God finds happiness in you. 
Through the waters of baptism, God doesn't just say this to Jesus. God says this to every one of us. God finds happiness in you. There are people outside these walls who need to hear this message. There are people inside these walls who need to be reminded of this message because they are going through a struggle where they feel disconnected and isolated. 